welcome to another edition of the 49er Goldcast. San Francisco, are you ready? Bam, boom, bing. Welcome to another edition of the 49er Goldcast. I'm your host, Rudy Salisa III, and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Salisa I, baby. And our esteemed co-host. Old Man Davis. Bam, bam, bam. Gentlemen, preseason game three. It's in the books. It's done a lot to say, a lot of observations. I cannot wait to hear what you gentlemen have to say. Raymond, let's start with you. Well, I think like most Niner fans, I'm going to start off, though, are the highest highlight out of anyone's analysis of the game, and that's starting with Navarro Bowman. Boom! Uh, two sacks on Manning. Uh, that first off, straight a dog blitz. It was, he was the only one blitzing uh, in that package. And the second one was the cross dog blitz. That's where Will Hoyt blitzes from a crossover route following Bowman's lead. Uh, just beautiful speed, amazing. Uh, and even he said after the game, he said that he has a really natural instinct and uh, really enjoys the blitz packages, which is something we did not see a lot of him doing under Vic Fangio's scheme. And Eric Mangini is a blitz monster. He likes to run complex schemes. He's running the 3-4 still, only now he's really utilizing uh, Bowman's speed for pass rush in addition to coverage, which is something really great. Vic Fangio played more of a soft cover four type scheme and we're going to see Mangini do a lot a lot more complex stuff over there. That, and I liked all everything I saw. Uh, speaking of his speed, he looks burstier than before even the injury. Is that just me? I feel like he, maybe it's just I haven't seen him in a while. Cle- clearly, he's the fastest linebacker out of everybody there, possibly even the fastest player on that defense, the corner. Hold on real quick to comment on that. I think there's a couple reasons for that. A, I think he spent a tremendous amount of time in rehab working on rebuilding his leg, rebuilding his running, rebuilding his speed. So I think it was something he was getting reacclimated to, and it was almost like starting from, from scratch, only knowing what he knows now. Secondly, the loss of so many strong players in the in the defensive scheme, have I think his, his speed stands out even more now because there aren't guys getting there even faster than him, which I think was happening when we had Patrick Willis, Alden Smith, and other players as such. Um, and I think that Borland, contributes Borland to was deceptively fast. He could shoot the run gap really well, but you wouldn't necessarily see that same sort of burst in coverage. Going forward, Acker was another one that stood out to me. His man coverage looked really tight on the outside. In fact, he had two pass breakups in the red zone, which is the best possible time to make that kind of play. The first, that turnaround to pick Manning off of Demarius Thomas's uh, end zone post route. The other pass breakup was on the crossing route, also in the end zone. Dante Johnson also had a pass breakup in the red zone. That's three potential touchdowns right there negated by really good coverage on our corners there. Uh, Johnson was not as stout when playing the slot receiver, which he did later in the game, and he did allow some catches there for some yardage a couple times. But he did close the gap to negate any big yak damage, yak meaning yards after the catch. Those were the the big standouts for me on defense. Uh, Offense, you know, definitely a little shaky. Clearly they're doing some switching and shuffling over there on the offensive line. And you can definitely see a difference in the skill level uh, for some of the guys they had in this week versus the first two games. I'm curious what to see what the rotation is going to look like in game four. Because after that, we're definitely going to they're definitely going to have to make a decision as to who the starting uh, front offensive line is going to be, especially in that center and the right guard position. OK, see, now that's something I want to talk about. You talked about the pause of an old man, Davis. I'm going to throw this to you very quickly here. So I knew you would focus on the positives. I want to focus on the glaring negative that began very subtly in game one, reared its ugly head in game two, and then to me looks full bore in game three. Now, Again, Raymond, you're the analysis. I'm always looking at things from the Bay Area San Francisco sports fan perspective. That's me. I'm your average Joe Montana. All right, so (laughs) this is what's bothering me, okay? Let's go game one at Houston. Cap is rushed on third down and throws the ball way too late. He was out of bounds, but the refs didn't call it. Remember how that play concerned me? He went one for three, no touchdowns. Okay, remember that. Game two, home versus the Cowboys. Cap is sacked once, 14-yard loss. His first sack of the season, he goes two for five, no touchdowns. Game three, Cap is sacked twice, total 13-yard loss. He again goes two for five, no TDs. I checked last year's preseason stats. I was just curious. I was just curious. Remember how last year all of the problems that we saw on a micro scale in preseason just became 
uh, just grew to a macro scale on the regular season. Everything that we saw troubling the 49er offense began in the preseason and it just carried over and would not stop haunting them for the entire season. True. Also a different coaching regime, different philosophy, as well as uh, inner turmoil that nobody would address. Very true, very true. But just Cap, continued to escalate. You're right, you're right. Cap didn't score once during last year's preseason, and those offensive scoring woes continue to haunt us for the rest of the year, particularly in the fourth quarter. And let's not forget, okay, Cap was not sacked once during last year's preseason, but he was sacked 52 times last year during the regular season. He's already been sacked Three times in three games. I just feel like right now, this is what scares me. And I'm voicing the fan opinion. So I'm going to want to hear what you have to say. And then I want to hear what Old Man Davis has to say about this. As a fan, as someone who doesn't look at the game and can break it down like an ESPN analyst, okay? I feel like, judging from what I'm seeing, we are picking up right where we left off. The production I'm seeing from Cap and the offensive line terrifies me. So, Ray, help me and the rest of the Goldcast listeners help us. Understand what what are we looking at? Because this, to me, is not a good start to the season. Well, the first thing to understand is that the rotations that you see in the game, especially in the Denver game, with Cap had a lot more pressure coming off of him, especially on the right side in the Broncos game than he did against Dallas. And to a lesser degree, the Texans, they only played one series, including the offensive line. They played that one series with Cap, with the exception of Staley and Boone. You saw some changes on the right side. So... The starting lineup in the first two games was Joe Staley at left tackle, Alex Boone at left guard, Joe Looney at center, Marcus Martin at right guard, and Eric Pierce at right tackle. That same lineup was consistent against the Dallas Cowboys, which played a lot better, especially we saw that long drive that ended up in the end zone. Unfortunately, they didn't get the six points out of it, but we did see them sustain a drive. Overall, their, their run blocking is excellent. It's the pass protection that, once again, seems to be struggling. However, in the Broncos game, we saw a couple of differences. Number one, Staley and Boone were the constants at left side. We didn't see a lot of pressure coming off the left side. Those two are very solid. You have two Pro Bowl. Well, Alex Boone plays at a Pro Bowl level, hasn't been selected there yet. Staley's a three-time Pro Bowler there. Marcus Martin moved over from right guard to center. That's a huge difference. Yeah. The center is basically the quarterback of the offensive line. Joe Looney did not play. Silverman came in at right guard instead of Marcus Martin. And Silverman was the guy you saw really um, who really, really struggled to the point where towards the end of the second quarter, they brought in DeVay, which is a guy they picked up off the trade from the tight end trade that they got. But that then they brought him in, and he was the guy, one of those facts. The safety was Eric Pierce because DeMarcus Merritt just outran Eric Pierce there. But uh, Eric Pierce has actually played pretty decent. I also like Trent Brown over on the right tackle slot who played in the later series. Again, he was a second unit team that played against the second unit defenses in the other preseason games. I thought he's he's a lot bigger than Eric Pierce. Eric Pierce is not bad. Some of his pass blocking technique doesn't always convince me. He did give up the huge safety, which was a huge sack, huge sack. But Silverman was the guy to really focus on for most of that pressure that Cap was seeing in that game. He just rewatched the tape. Um, I basically rewatched the game and watched it five times to watch each individual offensive lineman on every play. And Silverman was clearly the weakest link in the Broncos game who was letting most of that pressure come in. Every time they did a stunt, he failed to pick up his block. Uh, other times, guys would literally just run right past them. Um, in other cases, he would just get bulled right into a cap, and it would close the pocket, and cap was uh, forced to flush out uh, or throw the ball away. And in the other two occasions, they were sacks. So what happens in game four is the question now. Will we see Silverman again? Will we see DeBay again? Will we see Markin at center again? I'm not sure. I mean, do we go back to the Looney Martin Pierce over there from center to right? Or will we see more Brandon Thomas? Because he comes in in the second unit, too. Um, will we see more DeVay, more Trent Brown? I'm not sure because they've been, they've been really tinkering with the first lineup that I mentioned in the first two games. That seems to be the one they like the most, but I'm curious to see what will happen here in this game four. But that's kind of a crash course on what people need to understand is why you saw a difference. Um, people might think like, oh, it's escalating and it's getting progressively worse, but the actuality is they're actually switching up players, and some of those players are not good enough to handle uh, top-tier pass rushers. Old man Davis, your thoughts? Thank you, boys, for that lovely introduction of Poison. Welcome to the show. Yeah, Welcome thank to you. the show, old man Davis. Okay, number seven does only what he knows best for his team, and that is run with the ball. He can't do anything else, and he's proven that again 
this past game against the Broncos. Now, granted, the offensive line is lacking that type of blocking support for any quarterback to manage time handling the ball, especially during defenses that aren't even showing those blitzing packages. They weren't blitzing, and yet he got sacked. So Silverman, DeBay, Pierce, Thomas, whoever, you got a lot of work ahead of you. And if it was me that was coaching, I'd get that yardstick I always carry with me and slap it across your back and tell you to go run some laps. Because you're certainly not helping us out, so you might as well help yourself out and lose a couple pounds while you're working out. You son of a bitch. Let's talk about Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning was such a professional butcher in that whole first half of the game. He not only got sacked, but he was throwing yards. Something that number seven did not do and cannot do this preseason. Tremendous job by that defense against the Broncos offense, but not as good as what the Broncos defense defense did against the 49ers offense. So Bowman and whoever you want to tout and boast a great linebacker, defensive back, lineman, Ray, but they were still a weak defense compared to the Broncos. And I give a uh, tremendous props to the Broncos for that and, and Gary Kubiak. Good job, guys. Our Bowman almost got as many sacks as their top two defensive players combined. I, mean, I don't really tackles. care. Okay. When I'm talking, it it's orange and blue. <laughs> I thought it was Peyton, Peyton silver Manning and black. He got sacked twice. He got deflected three times, and he threw a pick. If you guys are ready to shut your mouths and listen, then I can continue. In the meantime, you're wasting time. You, okay? you may be allowed to speak. First team offense for both teams. I don't want to say the secondary was the weak link during play, but overall, the defense is what lacked discipline at certain points of the game, and they just couldn't stop that Gary Kubiak offense. So I'm not sure what's more discouraging to see. That Denver offense not capitalizing in the red zone to make what should have been 16-3 by halftime. Or the fact number seven couldn't get a rhythm offense going in for 1-1. One, one. All right. Well, it's clear that the Silverman-Pierce combination does not work as well as the Martin-Pierce combination. But I'm curious as to what, what are we not seeing in practice that has him convinced that Pierce should get this many reps versus some of the other guys like Trent Brown. I just don't know. I don't That's know. kind of those behind the curtain stuff that we just don't see. And it's really hard to make a judgment based off the stuff we're not seeing. Yeah. You know, I, but it's hard to judge. And it's not fair to also judge these guys, the second unit team say, Oh, well they did really good when the, the truth of the matter is they're playing second unit defenses. You know, something besides the offense and defense, not to pick on one over the other, but the penalties still came back to bite them in the ass. Seven for 55 yards in the first half alone. And and Rudy, I don't watch the second half. So if that all occurred in the first half, well, don't wake me up from my nap and tell me what going on in the second half. 13 for 113 total yards. And you are going to talk to me about the silver and black and their penalties? Go home and tell that to your dad. Oh, don't you start with me. I just did. Third down efficiency, two for 11. I, that, I know. Oh, Raymond, that bugs me too. Well, uh, aside from the two runs that Cap had and, and the couple completions he had, it's really hard to get set when you don't have time to throw. Now, here's the thing. You can put any quarterback in that scenario, whether it's Peyton Manning or Derek Carr. Aaron Rodgers or Derek Carr, and they would all have similar struggles. I mean, I, and those guys are not even half as fast as Colin Kaepernick is to avoid that pass rush, you know, would, and so you tell me, would they, would they fare any better than cap in that situation? I'm not trying to put it all in the offensive line, but it starts with the offensive line. So when you can't even get planted and Tom Sula said this in the press conference, said, look, here's the thing. When you can't get into that, then it's pretty hard to complete a play. And so, it, but if you get pass protection, then guess what? A quarterback in the league is going to be able to make plays. Any quarterback. I agree. All he needs is protection. Okay. Even Derek Carr can make plays under that kind of protection. But when you have the opposite happening, the same results happen. So it doesn't matter who's back there. He's still not going to be able to make plays if he can't plant his feet in time. to get. It's all rhythm. It's all time. And it's all mathematical. When that math is disrupted by a pass rush, and kudos to Denver for having really stout. They have a lot of speed on that defensive front to cause a lot of havoc, which means they can play that soft cover four scheme that we used to play because they have the guys to do it. We don't have that luxury anymore, which is why we're going more to a blitz package scheme to help relieve some pressure off the secondary, but also to create some more pressure on the quarterbacks. Oh, mm, mm. are you done? Because I'm ready. I'm ready to take you back to school.
not college. Preschool. Okay? Let's not use that as an excuse. Because if I remember reading after the game, I noticed how is it, and this is a question for you two, how is it that a second string quarterback can produce more for his squad than number seven? He's facing second unit defenses. He also has a different offensive line under him. Exactly. He has a weaker second team offensive line. And a weaker defense. No DeMarcus Ware. No, no, uh. Von Miller. Yes, thank you. Uh, he has the different defensive front. No DeMarcus. There's a Pro Bowl, Pro Bowl pass rusher. No more. No Von Miller. Also Pro Bowl pass rusher. Those two guys out of the equation make a huge difference. It took the whole success of the third quarter, Blaine Gabbard, to take the lead over the Broncos compared to the two quarters of Colin Kaepernick to score only three points to realize once again this week the quarterback is not number seven. Oh, and don't stop if I've said this before, because I'm not sure. Should for whatever reason, number seven stop playing this season. Blaine, how'd you like to get some playing time? Oh my God, they're gonna have to how'd you like to year? How'd you like to help this team down? A path to the Super Bowl. Because it could happen this year if you were playing. Oh, jeez. It's, it, it's easy to say that when you're not looking at the big picture. And the, the reality is he's playing second tier. He's say, playing second and third unit defenses under a completely different offensive line. That is clearly more skillful than against those units than the first unit is against the first tier defense. Put that same line up against the first tier defense and see if they fare just as well. I guarantee you they do not, which is why they are a second unit in the first place. Boom! Gentlemen, ex- okay, okay, here we go. I got one more question. I got one more question. I can't let this slide. After everything you've seen, Old Man Davis, uh, we still have one more game Early overreactions are the 49ers in big trouble. Your thoughts, old man Davis. Rudy, it's just preseason. What are we getting all of our feathers worked up for, huh? This will all subside and resolve itself by game one. And I can't wait to start the season off fresh O and O. So, do I smell trouble? Nope. But I do smell a lot of shit on the sidelines. (laughs) And it better get cleaned up, because there ain't no room in Oakland for it. Because we got that all cleaned up. Pull up your boots. A lot of it. Raymond, your thoughts. Similar to what Old Man Davis said, one thing that people should definitely always, always do, most your average fan does not, but I'm going to say it again, do not put a lot of stock in the preseason. Preseason is all about rhythm for the starters. It's all about making the team for the rookies. And as far as when you have offensive line issues like the Niners did last year and you come into a season where you've lost a couple of guys and you have all this depth, including unproven guys, you do have to do a lot of mix and matching to not only get them into rhythm speed by the time the regular season starts, but more so you need to solidify who the starters are going to be because once you go that route, then it's going to be hard-pressed during the middle of the season, if you realize, hmm, this guy didn't quite work out, we need to make a switch. Now you kind of have to start all over again with that relationship to a degree. So, but again, don't put don't put a lot of salt on this, guys. Don't put a lot of salt. Put a grain. Because that's all you're going to need. Not just I'm not saying that the Niners aren't going to have learning curves and growing pains this year because they are. You don't lose that many players without having some kind of effect on their productivity. But what we're seeing in the preseason here is not indicative of what we're going to be seeing all regular season long. There's going to be a lot of highs. There's going to be some lows. Not sure how that's going to quite equate to wins and losses, but there's only one thing to do, and that's to see it all out. All we got to do is be faithful. (laughs) Our next segment comes from Deadspin.com. Barry Pachetsky reports that Russell Wilson, Seahawks quarterback turned Reliant Recovery Water investor, claims that... Reliant Recovery Water helped him recover from a head injury he received during last year's NFC Championship game against the Packers. He then recanted this testimonial a day later, saying, I uh, didn't have a head injury, but uh, I was trying to say I think it helped prevent it. I think your brain consists of like 75, 80% water. So I think that just being hydrated, drinking recovery water really does help. Yeah, you heard that right, guys. Apparently, according to Russell Wilson, Reliant Recovery Water helps cure concussions or 
concussion like systems because your brain consists of like 70 to 80 percent water. Hey, hey, Russell, I got a bridge in Brooklyn I want to sell you. Oh, man, Davis, hey. your thoughts. <laughs> the jury is out on this one. <laughs> you never know. Mr. Wilson. Based on all that's been written about this, uh, particularly uh, what got published in Rolling Stone in the interview with him and the writer, the man knows dollars and cents. He just doesn't know science. <laughs> if we're that close to being convinced nanobubbles, then I'm likely to convince anybody far or near that tetra, te yes, tetra bubbles. If you encase yourself in a bubble, you can potentially prevent yourself from getting hurt. Put yourself in a tetra bubble. You got a great agent, business partners, got good people talking around you. I'd say that this is just as potential of a business move as it was for 50 Cent and his vitamin water. Formula 50. Formula 50. The man made billions. So uh, Russell uh, Wilson thinks he can make. Nano millions? <laughs> uh, maybe he's going to start supporting uh, raw milk, too. Unpasteurized milk. Nano bubbles. What are nano bubbles? Raymond, your thoughts. I'm not sure where logic escaped Russell Wilson, but clearly it's not there when he's off the field. I'm pretty sure he was just dehydrated. I mean, I get headaches when I'm dehydrated, and those are technically concussion-like symptoms. <laughs> so, I mean, in all seriousness, it's very well plausible that he could have just been dehydrated and realized that the carbonated water he was drinking, these nanobubbles, simply rehydrated him, thus causing his headache to go away. At least that's how I'm seeing it. But then again, I can think. Well, you got to remember, Ray, your brain consists of, like, 75, 80% water. So. Right. So clear, so when you drink, that water clearly all goes, travels up to replenish that 80%, should any of it be missing at any point in time. Well, well the nano bubble, the nano bubble rises. And so the right. water goes upwards towards your brain. It actually. Right. As soon as they pop, that vapor goes up. That's how smart it is. Hence why we have the nano term even involved. Well, nano bubbles are very bright. They're like self-aware bubbles, and so what you, when you drink that self-aware bubble, it, it goes to the, to the 75 to 80 percent water yes, part of your they brain. they have a biological central processing unit that allows them to independently travel up <laughs> the navel cavity and up into the brain to replenish any source of water that's been lost due to head trauma. It, it only goes to the watery part of your brain because, see, 75 to 80 percent of your brain is just water. It's right. like it's like a like the Pacific Ocean in there. And so right, you, exactly. so the nano bubble what it does is it skips the solid part of your brain and goes to the water part of the brain, the 75 80% water part. It's That's extraordinarily intelligent water. Intello water. Intello water. Intello water. Yeah, intello water. I don't think it needs <laughs> magic bubbles is what he calls it. We call it here intello water. Be on the lookout in, for the Goldcast's brand new product intello water. Yes, in layman terms Magic bubbles. Magic bubbles. We will definitely be releasing IntelliWater coming to a liquor store near you. Not to be confused of actual bubble formula that kids use at birthday parties. Right. This is not don't vitamin water. Don't drink that. Whatever you do, don't yet. Yeah, do not drink bubbles. It's bad for you. I think, I think Russell Wilson should sponsor more products than just these nano bubbles. I think He's he should. something. He is on to something. He is. Old Man Davis, your thoughts. What else should he sponsor? Well, talking with uh, some of my brand ambassadors in our marketing uh, department, I found what could be very useful for Russell Wilson in his entrepreneurial endeavors, eye drops, <laughs> the kind that help you recover your vision if it's lost at any point of the game. Nano eye drops? Like I was saying earlier, we can go past nano. We'll go down to the next metric unit, which is pico. That's that's three decimal places more than the nano. Yeah, that's, that's three more. <laughs> exactly. So down to the molecule. You guys are talking about water. That's that's so macro. I'm going micro, micro. Subatomic level. Okay. I just it was before the Earth was made. That's that's how 
life began was just this little eye drop. And so they've discovered it in, 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 in eye drops. Your quarterback loses vision. Or it could be any position. The punter, he loses vision. Got a bad streak, so he's got to improve. How does he? How does he get back in the game? Jimmy, coach, I can't. I, I don't have the stuff. Oh, you should use Russell Wilson's eye drops. Why didn't I think of that? A Russell Wilson spanks, spankswear for men. Spankswear. I'd call it the 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 vision of the Seahawk. <laughs> it gives you gives you eyes like Seahawk. You know, I I don't know if you guys realize this. Super Bowl twenty three. Right before the John Candy drive, Joey Montana, Joey Legend, he was blinded on the sideline. And Randy Cross had to put those Intelligente eye drops in his eye. And that's how he could see John Candy from that far away. Because when the other players turned around, they actually couldn't see that far. Joe could because of the eye drop. Now we have the evolved form brought to you by Russell Wilson. I got another one, guys. Chewing, chewing gum. Chewing gum. Chewing gum. You get the glucose that you can put inside the gum, and it goes straight to the bloodstream. Why you... stop there? E-cigarettes with nano vapors inside of them. Oh. So, so. The... Nano cigarettes. Nano cigarettes. Nano ret. Nano ret. Nano vape. <laughs> nano vape. Nano vape. Hey, that's the real thing. I smoke two nano rets before every game to give me. The lung capacity to do all the things I do. I feel like if you had a nano ret or bubble gum going right to your bloodstream, it would probably give you godlike abilities because actually 75 to 80 percent of your body is made of bubble gum. That's I like that. Terrific. Yeah, that's fantastic. And and one more Hit shoe us. polish. The same shoe polish that Russell Wilson uses to cover his cheekbones. Mm-hmm. I'd encourage him to sell shoe polish. To Pop Warner kids so that they can feel like they're Russell Wilson. But the thing about the shoe polish is it absorbs into your skin and you don't get as you don't get the sunburn. Well, you know what else it does? Because 75 to 85 percent of your cheek is actually made of shoe polish. So when you put it on the cheek, the cheek expands so that when you get hit, it actually protects your face plate. That's a that's an official doctor's term for for the the bones in your face it's a it's a face plate and because your cheeks are made of shoe polish it 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 rises and it's like creates like a pad like area around the face behind the face mask of the football helmet i didn't even know that was true until russell wilson brought up the 80 percent uh brain water there's a lot of things your body's made out of 75 to 80 percent of a lot of different things it just depends on what part of the body we're talking. Right, and it depends on what, when Russell Wilson speaks, that we can even learn about this stuff. Because only Russell knows. So I think uh, if there's anything we learned about these headlines that Russell Wilson has created for himself is the more you talk, number three, the more America gets smart. Well, because 75 to 85 percent of your body is made of Russell Wilson. And 75 to 80 percent of what Russell Wilson says is a lot of bullish. <laughs> Well, he's a Seahawk. What do you expect? Oh, and there's you <laughs> son of a bitch. Bam. Dun, dun, dun. Raymond, when's the, uh, when's the next game? Where can we see it? Who are we playing? The final preseason game yes. this year will take place in San Francisco Levi Stadium Thursday, 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 September 3rd. That yes. is coming up in just a few days here, gentlemen. <laughs> San Diego Chargers are coming to town to Levi Stadium, 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time which means a 7 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Yes. Hey, hey, Sally Rose Sham here. I'll be at Levi Stadium. So if you happen to see me, wave at me and I'll give you a hug. Philip Rivers, Philip Rivers, we're coming after you. <laughs> you know, a, a gold cast episode is just not complete without at least one comment from Sourdough Sam. Raymond, where can they find us? They can find us on Twitter at 49ers Gold Cast. In addition, they can find us on Facebook. Simply type in 49ers Gold Cast. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. In addition, you can find me at Ray Solis on Twitter. In addition, you can find me on Instagram at Real Ray SF. How about you guys? Old Man Davis, where can they find you? You can find me at the Chapel Old of the Davis. Chimes Mausoleum. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget 
to subscribe to us on iTunes. We are on iTunes. If you look up the Gold Cast, you search it, you'll find us right there. Same exact logo that you see on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Rudy Solis Third. R U D Y S O L I S three R D at Rudy Solis Third. Don't forget to subscribe, like us on Facebook, check it out, share with your friends. Here we go. One more game left, gentlemen, before the start of the regular season. I'm your host, Rudy Solis the Third, and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Solis the First, baby. And our esteemed co-host. Old man Davis. Bam! We'll see you next week. Same gold cast time. Same gold cast channel. One last thing about this past game. That Anquan Bolden, if you're listening, you're nothing but a...